So our topic this time is entirety, and this is our second of five sessions here at Mindful Biology. You'll recall from the last session that we're taking a relational approach. We're looking at reality or the world around us and the people around us as if they are something with which we have a conscious relationship. My opinion is that we always have some sort of relationship. The goal here is to make it more conscious and more intentional. We're using the venerable four element system that derives from many ancient traditions as mentioned last time. In this talk, we'll focus on the earth element and how we relate to it. From a scientific perspective, the earth element is closely aligned with what scientists refer to as the solid phase of matter and which we're quite familiar with in solid substances all around us. If we look at a familiar chemical compound, H2O or water, we know that it occurs in a solid form. We call that ice. And the water molecules, when they're in the form of ice, are arranged in a very regular pattern, with fairly tight bonds uh, one to the next, which makes for a stable, solid substance. This is the basis of the solidity of solid matter. In this talk, we'll be working with the earth element in terms of the solid phase of matter, but also in terms of some more metaphorical features. In particular, we'll be talking about the earth element as something that does, after all, pertain to the planet Earth upon which we reside. Within the Buddhist tradition, it's said that after awakening from delusion and the difficulties of human existence, the Buddha was confronted by the forces of delusion and they demanded to know by what authority he broke through the veil. And the legend says that he reached down and touched the earth in the gesture shown by this statue to indicate that the earth was his authority for awakening. So there is something authoritative and potent about connecting with the earth. And that's one of the goals of this talk is to help us feel more in touch with that aspect of the earth element. I mentioned last time that the mindful biology approach has a few different strategies, one of which is to use basic scientific and biological information to help us feel more sensitively into our human bodies, to have a more informed way of assessing all of the feelings that we experience there. And we will be emphasizing this approach in this talk. So as we feel into this body that we each carry through the world, it's worth remembering that it is, of course, part of the earth. All of the matter that composes it came from the earth. It evolved here. It survives here by virtue of a living biosphere that creates the conditions that allow life to continue. So there's a very real sense in which the earth is in the body and the body is of the earth. Of course, we also have this thing we call a mind where we experience feelings and perceptions and thoughts and so on. And it is quite clearly very closely aligned with the organ we know as the brain. And the brain itself is made of the same stuff as the rest of the body. And yet the mental apparatus tends to take itself away from the body in a certain sense and look back upon it as if from a distance. As we move through this talk and later talks, we'll begin to see ways in which we can bring the mind into closer relationship, more intimacy with the body, not so distant. But as a starting point, we can simply accept the mind's tendency to hold itself at a remove. 
and look at the body as if from a distance. We can then simply accept as a given the idea that mind and body are in some sort of relationship and work on improving the quality of that relationship. I like to compare the relationship between mind and body to the relationship between two humans who form an intimate partnership. There will be times of sweetness and supportiveness and admiration, but there will also be times of frustration and conflict and difficulty. This is just the nature of relating. As time goes on and people spend more and more years and decades together in relationship, often some of the conflict melts away and they gradually become more and more harmoniously bonded and less and less experiencing life as two separate individuals, but rather coming to the world as a kind of unit where they each know each other's wants and needs very intimately. And there's a long term sense of support and even a sense in which they perhaps begin to resemble one another. Wouldn't it be nice to over time begin to settle back into the body with this kind of harmony and connection. This would be, I think, a worthy goal. So we will use the earth element to move in that direction. Of all the different parts of the body, perhaps the most earthly is the skeleton. That's the one that has the most mineral content. It's the most solid. And this aspect of being solid is one of the key features of the earth element in those ancient traditions. Within Buddhism, for instance, when we meditate upon the earth element in the body, we focus upon areas that feel solid. Now the solidity of the skeleton comes from solid matter. Similar to what we saw in the case of ice, the crystals within bone are composed of atoms that are regularly arranged and have tight bonds with one another. In this case, they're calcium and phosphate as well as others. This creates the mineral crystal that gives bone its hardness and much of its strength. Of course, there are also organic elements. The organic elements lay down the crystal in particular patterns. Here we're looking at a thin section of bone that's had all of its cellular content removed, but you can still see the evidence of life here because the arrangement of the bone crystals it has this kind of weaving appearance to it. There's a web-like linear structure. And what's going on here is that as we live, our bones respond to the stresses they experience and the cells within them lay down calcium phosphate crystals in alignment with the stresses on the bone in order to strengthen it in just those ways that are needed. By doing that, they avoid laying down a lot of excess crystal, which would increase weight without adding strength. The calcium that is in our bones is the same calcium that's in limestone deposits, such as these vast cliffs in Dover. Because these cliffs came from the skeletons of sea creatures that lived millions of years ago, and they died in their hard shells were compressed and eventually became rock. And then the rock was uplifted and is now exposed and the mineral can wash free and it enters the drinking water and eventually can enter human bodies. And without doubt, the calcium that's in my bones and yours has cycled through many prior organisms of sea and land over eons. And this brings up another aspect of the earth element which is the way it roots us in the earth and roots us in the history of life. We are connected to all life in this cyclic way that calcium moves through our bodies and the bodies of all creatures. So this is a good time to stop the video for a bit, take a few slow, deep breaths and feel into the solid parts of your own body, into your own earth element and contemplate how far we have come so far before resuming the video and going further. 
So let's look a little more at the way the earth element and in particular the skeleton roots us in life and on earth. Here we're looking on the left at a picture of a human skeleton, a drawing, very familiar. And on the right, a photograph of a fossil hominid skull from 1.8 million years ago. So this is a creature that was probably not too distantly related from our direct ancestors. And you can see there's a clear resemblance, a similarity in the skull structure, but also important differences, particularly in the size of the part above the eyes. So what we're looking at here is the way the skeleton provides a record of evolution. Indeed, skeletons have given us much of our information about how we evolved as a species. So some seven million years or so ago, our ancestors were a lot like chimpanzees in appearance and skeletal structure. And a couple hundred million years earlier, they were more like lizards, low-slung creatures. And another 150 million years earlier than that, they were fish-like creatures. And so the skeletons that we find in the strata of rocks reveal this evolutionary progression. And of course, these forms persist to the present day, fish and lizards and chimpanzees and so on, showing us that we are related to all life and that in the distant past is where we find our common ancestry. Of course, organisms have more going on inside them besides the hard parts, besides the skeleton. And so we can see the whole creature drawn out in each case here. And we can also see a little creature without a skeleton, the worm on the far right. Our earliest ancestors prior to fish, about 500 million years ago or more, were probably quite a bit like worms in their morphology. They were linear creatures with digestive tubes running down the middle, uh, also nerve cords running down the length of the body. They had little projections off to the side which served uh, to give a basis for the later evolution of limbs. So we can now place all of these ancestor organisms in the context of the entire tree of life which began several billion years ago with the first life forms, which were something like bacteria. Life on Earth remained more or less bacterial for quite a long time, but eventually, as I mentioned a little over 500 million years ago, more complex multicellular animals began to develop like that worm-like creature, and before long, animals more like fishes and lizards and so on. Our lineage has thus traced a kind of path through the tree of life. And so here we are at the tip of one of the branches. Now, if we look at this worm-like ancestor from long ago, we can envision it as one of the seeds from which our current structure grew, our current bodies. So through the course of evolutionary time, our skeleton evolved in response to circumstances. And in a certain sense, that history remains within our skeleton, the history of the fish-like and the lizard-like and the chimpanzee-like ancestors. And as we meditate today, seated or lying down or walking with these skeletons giving us shape, we can be aware of this history and this ancestry and this legacy of the life that came before us and led to us. And so here again is another point where it makes sense to pause the video, take some deep breaths, contemplate what we've covered and feel the life in your own body, feel the ancestry, the rootedness, the way that your form now connects you with the forms of so many animals over such an immense length of time. So we can resume now looking again at the tree of life and add in this ancestor. A little over a billion years ago, our lineage 
grew out of creatures like this, single-celled, rather like what we call amoebas today. These were large and much more complicated than the bacteria that began life on Earth and which was the sole form of life for roughly two billion years. But eventually these much more complex forms evolved and they set the stage for us to evolve as large multicellular complex organisms. It's worth looking at this single cell in actual life. So here is a living amoeba and we can see that this creature is capable of moving in its environment. It's sensitive to its surroundings. It heads off in first one direction and then changes course and goes in another. It's a living being, though just one cell. And this brings up another important aspect of the earth element as we experience it in our bodies. Because cells like this populate the entire body and in particular populate the bone. And so the skeleton is not only solid, not only rooted, but it is also fundamentally and very importantly alive. So if we look at a major bone such as the thigh bone, the femur, and expand our view of it, we can begin to see those linear web-like elements that give the bone its oriented strength. And if we enlarge those, we can see that they're made of these concentric rings of mineral calcium phosphate. And then there are cellular components important to the life of the bone. There are cells that are interspersed that act to maintain the bone there are cells that add bone substance and build up new bone. And there are also cells that remove old bone as part of an ongoing remodeling process, adjusting the bone to suit the current stresses and needs. So we can use a simple animation to get a sense of how all this works. The calcium phosphate is this beige material the building cells are the blue ones, and the remover is the much larger salmon-colored cell. When we set things in motion, the remover gouges out some of the bone, removes it, leaves an opening there. And then the builders come in and they lay down more calcium phosphate, more mineral, restoring the bone, strengthening it. The balance between the removers and the builders is important to conditions like osteoporosis. And in fact, this video was put together by people that are performing research looking for drugs that can alter the balance between the action of one relative to the other. So we've now seen that the bone in our bodies is alive and rooted and solid. The brain with which I'm talking and your understanding is made of the same basic stuff. Not as much calcium, of course, but it is just as earthly in its origin and substance. And so it too is solid and rooted and alive. And so we can begin to see through the illusion of separateness between mind and body, recognizing that both are mediated by tissue with very similar properties. Last time I mentioned Emily Dickinson and we could close with one of her more famous poems. The brain is wider than the sky for put them side by side the one the other will contain with ease and you beside. If we substitute earth for sky, we can see that the brain contains the earth element in yet another sense now, that by comprehending the earth and the fact of the earth's presence in our bodies, we can actually bring the earth into consciousness as a concept, as an image of the globe, etc. We can bring all of this together, the earth, the skeleton, the mind, and then in meditation, experience the whole of it with much less separation, much less sense of isolation, mind from body.
And I encourage you to sit for a few moments with these concepts and then also breathe into your body, feel its earthy, solid qualities, all of it together, all of it part of your experience. Thank you for watching.